Feel Good Show. What the Fintech is a news and information platform covering the latest fintech development in Hong Kong, Singapore, China, and Asia. Join us every Wednesday for engaging conversation with various Asian tech figures to discuss about entrepreneurship, emerging technology, customer engagement, and partnership. Before starting this interview, feel free to share your comment in the uh, comment section. And also, if you can like it and share it with everyone, it would be great for us. Thank you very much. Today, we have Kelvin, CEO of Whispresso. Hello, Kelvin. How are you? Hi, thank you. I'm doing well. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, I saw you last year at Hong Kong uh, Science and Technology Park uh, for Demo Day. And I find your solution very interesting. So that's why I send you an email to, uh, to come oh, to that, the show. That's, that's great. And, and thank you for having me. It's such a great setup here. So Thank you very much. Um, before we start this discussion, maybe like for everyone who doesn't know you yet, uh, can you introduce yourself and what you are doing? What is your background? Sure, sure. So um, I founded the company about uh, four years, almost five years ago now. So I've been doing that since then. But before that, um, I, I used to work at uh, HSBC. So I came from a banking background, um, uh, also with uh, some experiences covering corporates, uh, along with uh, also looking across Asia. Uh, before that, um, I, I, I'm a bit of a hybrid, so I spend one third of my life in Canada. Okay. I, I was born in Canada, but actually grew up in Hong Kong. So uh, people call me a hybrid because I, I, I speak uh, English, uh, Cantonese, some Mandarin, but I'm also accustomed to both so, sort of the Western and Eastern uh, cultures, um, and, and which is why I think uh, I, I this is one of one differentiator when working in Hong Kong, especially doing startup, to face a lot of uh, Western uh, financial institutions, you know, especially in fintech, but with also growing uh, importance um, amongst those Chinese players as well. Well, uh, this is a, I cannot disagree with you because I'm also mixed. So for me, like I have two cultures and it's what I love about people it's when they bring like two cultures and they can, you know, grow with these cultures and share a lot of uh, love with those ones. Um, we kind of like we spoke about your company, Respresso. Can you just introduce quickly what is your company doing here? Yeah, so we are a Hong Kong-based um, technology company uh, specializing in capital market SaaS solutions. So uh, basically, our company specializes in natural language processing and deep learning. Uh, we're a team of around thirty people. Uh, almost um, more than seventy-five percent of us are data scientists uh, and software engineers. So. I'm sort of the semi-technical, less technical person, uh, but but I've learned a lot over time as well. So, uh, you know, my passion is in uh, computers, is in AI. So so it's great I can marry some of my previous experiences uh, along with uh, what I'm doing now. Uh, before we go more deep in your into your company, uh, one of my questions I like to ask to all the entrepreneurs coming here. Becoming an entrepreneur is sometimes a turning point in your life. What was your turning point to become an entrepreneur and start your business? Um, for me, uh, I think the moment is when I was working in banking. I had a lot of ideas around um, how we could make different processes or better th do things in a better way. Um, actually, entrepreneurship is not new to me. Um, it, back in university, uh, I was really passionate about entrepreneurship. In fact, I didn't do any finance-related study uh, until uh, when I, I go into business school, but also not as much as uh, I would have done if I worked in, worked in banking. So I was always planning to do some sort of startups. But when I came back to Hong Kong um, and then speaking with different mentors, I, I always keep a book with a lot of ideas on it. When, when I go around uh, the city, uh, when I travel, I, I keep track of, of ideas. Um, but, but coming back, you know, Hong Kong is still very financial driven. There's a, a, a few, a lot of professional service industries. So um, ended up, I, I went, uh, uh, worked at a bank uh, and, and did my CFA just to uh, patch up some of my financial knowledge. But I've always been, you know, looking for ways we could, we could innovate. So um, I think back then I was doing a lot of um, data-driven roles as well. And, and one of the biggest challenges, um, not just banks have, most corporates have, is how they uh, process or analyze unstructured data. So uh, I think as an analyst, I deal with a lot of models, financial models, but also read a lot of reports in order to you know, analyze things. And 
uh, basically, you know, I always think about how can we do this better, but it, with technology. Uh, I actually tried driving some initiatives in, internally uh, within the bank, but it, it, I found it very hard back then. So this is about five, six years ago. You know, I went all the way to the top trying to get budget, trying to, you know, push through some project, but it was really hard. So the moment is when I, I, I feel like, so I built things internally. People are very happy. They use it. But, you know, it's not nothing as complex as, as what we do today. Maybe it's some macro. It could be VBA. We all use that at some point. But when, when I see people enjoying it, I, I see, I, I feel very happy as well. And, and that's when I know, hey, I should do something uh, more akin to innovation. All right. But also leveraging uh, on, on what I know. Um, so, so essentially, with Espresso uh, specialize in natural language processing. What that means is how we comprehend uh, documents specifically for us. So our, our uh, core technology focus on training neural network that comprehend documents. Um, it's not OCR. So a lot of people misunderstood us as OCR, which is what, when you put a name card, you scan it, it put mm -hmm. in you know, all the info. Uh, basically, we use a neural network to um, understand and comprehend documents. And, and the benefit of that is we can actually understand the context uh, a lot better. We can also cover a wide range of unstructured documents. So we're talking about uh, annual reports, ESG reports, uh, prospectuses, uh, credit documents, and, and all that. So um, yeah, uh, and that's how I began my journey. Um, your, your product is focusing in English language or every language. Uh, do you have like some specificities about that in LP you are using? Yeah, great question. So um, of course, we're based in Asia, so so uh, English, Chinese, simplified, traditional. Uh, we we do have more clients uh, focusing on the, on those. But in fact, from a deep learning perspective, there's actually a lot of multilingual transformers. So sometimes I tell people it doesn't matter uh, because um, we are actually not only training the AI on what languages to read, we are training them how to read um, documents. Uh, within certain contexts or without context, but regardless of the language, still be able to identify relationships uh, between different elements. So we're talking about chats, graphs, tables, paragraphs. And only when you identify those features, then you can go into a paragraph and say, hey, uh, if it's a credit document, you know, what's the deal size? What are the collaterals? You know, those come after. But the first stage is how you as a as an person would read it and teach that think thinking process to the AI. And how's the idea of doing this came to you? Because you spoke about your journey at HSBC before, creating the solutions, but yeah. you didn't tell me how you really focus on the idea of doing the NLP for this document. Yeah. It's quite a long way. So uh, when the company first started, um, it was really hard to do banking solutions right away, as in serving banks, because, you know, banks have a very rigorous uh, process, especially on core banking system. Uh, despite the first idea is how we apply NLP on credit, on, you know, uh, not just credit, but understanding main management capabilities. So looking at more alternative data, how we can complement that with the traditional approach. Um, it was really hard to get in there, so we first started focusing on equity research. Um, so essentially, uh, one of our very first client uh, was Credit Suisse. Essentially, we did not pitch them, we did teach-ins. So we, okay. we had a lot of passion in NLP and how we apply that to un unconventional data. So looking at perhaps e-commerce data or even um, regulatory documents. So applying and a layer of NLP, but reading um, un untraditional, non-traditional um, documents. And basically, uh, we did a teach-in. They were really excited. Some of the MDs actually say, tell us, hey, you need to come back again because half of my team are, uh, were not there. So we did a second teach-in, but that was already sort of a work meeting. Um, that was great. I, I feel very blessed to have you know people who appreciate this. And this is... This was uh, quite a while ago, maybe three, four years ago. And, and so we started in equity research. But, but essentially, uh, what 
we found is we need scalability and doing alternative data had its challenges. Everyone wants exclusivity. You don't want to share, you know, your secret data with other people. So as a startup, uh, we need to find sort of common pain points, right? Um, so back then it's about finding edge throughout a, a review research process. And essentially what we ended up doing at first uh, was building our uh, first search engine. So the, it's, uh, the search engine is similar to how, to how Google works, but instead of searching the uh, wide web, we search uh, regulatory documents, we search company filings and, and you know, documents that are relevant to um, research analysts. And uh, slowly over time, we grew that uh, uh, to cover more and more different stock exchanges. Uh, today, I think we cover 12 capital markets uh, more than 28,000 uh, publicly listed companies and, and over 50 million documents, right? So, so there's a, a, a lot of work put in to grow that. Um, but at, at some point, um, we met more partners, we met more um, friends uh, within the capital markets field. So there's a ton of stakeholders. Uh, we came across some uh, friends in the legal field. And, and basically, you know, within legal and legal tech, uh, at back then, a lot of focus was still, you know, project management, how it, we can improve workflow. Uh, AI wasn't really a thing within the legal tech field. So some lawyers look at our search engine and say, hey, we can actually apply that to due diligence. All right. So that is when we then started our second platform. So the first platform, the search engine was uh, is called Discovery. Now, the second platform that we built is called Factify. And that is quite a, quite a, a ride. So essentially, uh, it started as a proof of concept. Uh, we worked with uh, one of the largest law firms uh, and essentially tried to understand uh, the workflow around uh, specifically transaction verification, so IPO verification. Um, so essentially, when you uh, file for an IPO, there's a prospectus. In Hong Kong, it's uh, notoriously long. It's about 600 pages, could be longer sometimes, could be slightly shorter. Uh, and essentially, what lawyers have to do is they have to circle up the whole documents. They have to index each statement, so each sentence by sentence. Even if it's a financial table, then it, it becomes each number by number. Uh, they apply reference IDs, and they also have to differentiate between what, what constitutes a fact versus an opinion, and they have to verify the facts. And if it's an opinion that they cannot verify, then somebody has to sign off on it. Um, so we feel that there's a, a lot of room where tech can help. It's a repetitive process, but still very important. And that's why we apply sort of the same document comprehension framework uh, to due diligence. Uh, and, and essentially, uh, that's how Factify was born. That, that gained a lot of traction, uh, actually won the HKICT Grand Fintech Award last year. Well, congratulations. Yes, yes. It's a big prize here in Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, yeah, if, for people in the tech industry, definitely. So every time you develop a product, it's because you have uh, a big copyright in front of you, having this need right. Yes, yes. And do you have this experience with uh, other products you could develop after this? Or it was mostly for those two ones? I'm glad you asked because a lot of times we don't build the product before we know their clients. Usually we follow where the client takes us and we call that a, a co-development, co-creation process. I, and I found that works really well, especially in a rapidly growing environment. So I'll, I'll take a few examples. So a lot of times clients tell us, you know, a lot of ideas. We love uh, engaging them in sessions where we don't talk about any of our products. We just ask, you know, uh, what they're up to. But most importantly, how do you want technology to, to help them? So uh, a lot of times we prioritize not just our pipeline, but we think about how we can co-create new solutions to, um, to grow their business. So a lot of times uh, technology, people think of it as a time-saving tool. Uh, we have a different view. We feel we should augment processes. So AI and people should coexist. Uh, we are not replacing workflows. We're augmenting them, meaning we are making you much stronger. So all the time, our scope is always uh, thinking about how we can build uh, new solutions where you can do your work better uh, with less time, but also unlock uh, possibilities where you can onboard either more clients or uh, create new businesses. So, for example, uh, most recently, um, with Co-Create, 
adopted a, a solution with uh, the Hang Seng Index. Basically, um, using the search engine, uh, uh, what we've done is we've helped them uh, build thematic indexes. So traditionally, they will uh, they may have a whole research team uh, to read through reports over months, uh, trying to identify uh, companies that are relevant to a specific theme. So, for example, most recently they've uh, launched a metaverse index. Okay. Um, essentially, uh, you know, uh, looking at what companies are somewhat or highly involved in the metaverse business. It could be upstream or downstream. Um, and essentially that would normally consume a lot of time uh, for, for the research analysts, not only to shortlist them, but to uh, review and, and make sure you know, these companies are, are relevant. So a lot of times, how, how do you start? Where to begin with? Because uh, if you're relying on tradition, uh, traditional industry classifications, uh, you don't have a metaverse uh, uh, right. tag, right? So, so what we've done is similar to Google. Uh, we help them analyze all the company metadata and, and documents. And just within minutes, they can already shortlist and screen uh, companies that are relevant to specific themes and, and uh, keywords. So uh, that's only phase one, right? Uh, we, we, we want to help uh, clients like this to create more uh, opportunities. So in that scenario, they can now have a lot more flexibility on testing, piloting different ideas. So I'm very you know, happy to, to see these. So you spoke about how you develop the product with your, you co-create your product with your partners. Do you have any business model right now? Do you do like a SaaS model? Do you do this by project or do you do this by memberships? They can just, you know, pay every month or every year for like two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, normally for uh, people who subscribe to our uh, existing products it, or work like a SaaS, so it's a subscription model. So depending on which platform you're talking about, it could either be a, per user slash workspace based. So a lot of our tools have actually have dedicated workspace where multiple uh, members of your team can log into the same space and share ideas and collaborate. So we always have collaborative aspect built within our research and due diligence uh, software. Um, apart from a usage uh, subscription based uh, model, uh, we also have co-creation model. So co-creation means um, we uh, it's different from customization because co-creation means we see a scope where this can become much bigger, not just for this client, but for the, uh, the entire industry. So a lot of times we, we um, uh, tell the client upfront, we're happy to enhance our product in a way that meets your requirement. Okay. But then uh, we, we still can uh, use this and replicate this success with a, a lot more, more other uh, companies. All right, so the co-creation model, basically we don't charge the client uh, uh, the total development cost. Basically, it's uh, the concept is we'll get there and by then you need to subscribe. <laughs> so it's like, a, you know, uh, the, the corporate version of Kickstarter, yeah. I would say. <laughs> kind of a agile methodology as exactly. well. Exactly. To, to um, what makes the difference between you and your competitors on the market? Because in Hong Kong, we know that there is a, a couple of NLP the NLP startups, uh, each seems to have a specificity there. What is yours? Yeah. So uh, looking at just the element itself, I know there are NLP uh, companies that focus on generation. It could be focusing on a different medium of, of text. Uh, it could be chatbot related, could be audio related. We are specifically focused on uh, capital markets documents or uh, business documents to be specific. So uh, PDFs, for example, is a very unique challenge here in Hong Kong and in Asia, because if you look at uh, capital market stocks in the US, they are mostly uh, quite structured in HTML uh, as well as uh, XBRL format. Uh, in Hong Kong, they are very colorful. Uh, they look like a yearbook. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's quite hard for a lot of investors here to um, easily understand and extract relevant insights from them. So we specialize on understanding that. But uh, on the other hand, we're different in a way because uh, a lot of times I describe my company having uh, the left arm and the right arm. On one hand, uh, we're doing research related products, which means we have um, data covering all over the world. And that enables us to power up our other hand, the left hand which is on due diligence. So that's more workflow specific. Uh, it's more um, basically 
focusing on documents that you own, which which is different from looking at publicly available documents. So uh, we are special because we are hybrid, having the big data capability compared to workflow um, collaboration, automation uh, capability. And combining both, I think we're quite unique that way. We don't com uh, compete directly with all the financial data providers because we do workflow as well. And we don't compete uh, uh, directly with the uh, legal tech because they don't do the, the data side. Are you focusing only on Hong Kong for your market or are you also like a, a cross country in Asia? Uh, we are cross country. So a lot of our clients are quite international. Uh, naturally, they always ask us to uh, whether they can scale that uh, within their network. Um, and uh, but, but being in Hong Kong, we're very well positioned to capture the rapidly growing financial markets here. So I think um, we have the advantage of setting the standards here in Hong Kong, especially when you, we're doing um, technology that are completely new for the region. So uh, replication and growth is definitely uh, on, on uh, in our plan. Um, Southeast Asia, looking also in Europe and, and the US potentially. Okay, interesting. Um, you mentioned you have 30 employees right now. Are they mostly engineers? Do you have sales? Do you have like uh, operation teams? Yeah, so uh, we are a very tech-focused company. Uh, more than 75, 80% of the team are from a technical background. So usually uh, for my company, uh, because it's so focused on um, building neural networks, uh, we actually have uh, our own annotation team just to create training data. And the reason why is uh, different from a B2C company where they would generally get data from the consumers. Uh, a lot of our, our neural network are quite specific to uh, certain professions and, and workflows. So uh, we have a team that do that. Um, uh, also data science team and, and product and so forth. So so it, our culture is quite lean and, and people talk to each other. We don't try to, you know, segment them into different departments. Everyone work together and, and we find that, uh, you know, very um, successful. Can you share more with us about the culture of your company and how you drive your company? Yeah, so uh, my, my motto is don't tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. Ask them what they want to do. I only ask the question. So basically, we have a very decentralized culture where we just, you know, promote um, trial and error. Uh, I never chase after someone if they make a mistake. Uh, just don't make it many times or, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, then, then it becomes quite silly. Um, I, for, for me, it's about, um, it's much more effective for our, our colleagues to tell me what they want to do because it's coming from them and usually they won't fail themselves, right? Uh, so so uh, I think the KPI is quite different. Um, a lot of times we look at uh, traction, we look at uh, usage of our technology rather than just revenue and, and cash. Uh, and then we found that quite different from you know the traditional approach. Um, I think the other piece is um, empowerment. So uh, apart from letting them tell me what to do, uh, which is also a, a type of empowerment, uh, we also have a very clear ownership you know, amongst people. So everyone is working on something important. There's no appendix within the, the company. And, and uh, we, we have people who very much enjoy that. And which is why, you know, startup is such a, a fun, fun industry. <laughs> and I would like to ask you a question about your team, but also about your product. So sure. you mentioned your teams can fail fast and, but learn, they need to learn fast and don't do make it, don't, don't make the mistake again. Um, and also you mentioned about the big corporate working with you and helping you to create a product. So how do you design the product? Do you do a lot of iteration? Do you do a lot of workshop with the companies? Um, how your teams is helping to improve the product as well? Um, yeah, how do you develop everything there? Sure. Um, a lot of times we would try to understand the style of the client first. So we've worked with a wide range of clients, some more traditional, some less so. Um, I guess for the more traditional ones, uh, we have to um, make sure we provide the right confidence, uh, but also uh, where, where their comfort zone is. Because um, you know everyone talks about agile. But not all companies like to work in an agile way, and we cannot force that upon clients. So I think our role is to be the listeners, right? Uh, we try to uh, be as flexible as we can when working with different clients. And essentially, uh, a lot of times, 
our our clients learn about what we do and genuinely has has an interest uh, on on how they can apply that internally. So I th- I find that as a very common theme, not just for us, but for uh, a lot of tech companies in Hong Kong. We sometimes put on the hat of um, you know product development, but more so uh, we are consultants, so management tech consultants, just showing what people could achieve with technology. So we call that the sort of user tech gap because uh, the users and users normally are not as um, informed about the latest technology as practitioners, but practitioners are also you know, not as informed about the current issues. So we try to close that by uh, not just showing them what we do, use cases, demo, that that is quite essential for, for us, but more importantly, I think bringing them through uh, an imaginative journey. So thinking about the vision of the company, that's even more important. So there's a top-down approach where we, apart from doing teach-ins, we actually um, brainstorm with the management about what could be achieved if we do this. So it's never a one-stage process, even if they're using some of our SaaS model, because we are also trying to fit in through uh, the... um, life cycle or journey of different uh, workflows for different professions. So um, for the more innovative companies or fast moving companies, then uh, we're dealing with a lot more sophisticated users. And sometimes we learn from them as well. Um, There are limitations uh, of what larger companies can or cannot do. Mm -hmm. And and that's also sometimes why they try to find a, a third party, a tech partner to do that. And, and we appreciate it. So we, we try to be as um, honest and transparent as possible. Uh, we don't oversell our capability. And essentially, we do a lot of um, explaining. So some, some companies, some startups may be a bit secretive about the technology. We're actually quite open that way. We let them know where our positioning is and we'll never compete with you (laughs) at some point. So I I think just building that trust is quite important. Transparency is really important for partnership with banks and uh, and large insurance. Um, Where do you see your company in the next couple of years? How do you want to continue your growth with your team, but also with your clients and customers? Yeah, so we're working on a lot of very interesting initiatives just within capital markets. Uh, I think a lot of attention uh, were, uh, was put on our how our products augment transactions. But in fact, there's still a, a huge room for periodic reporting. So apart from you know the IPOs, the rights issues, uh, and how we can verify them and perform due diligence and research for them, there's a huge uh, gap within periodic reporting, which means uh, annual drafting and verifying annual reports, and more importantly, ESG reports. So with uh, increasingly complex um, requirements, disclosure requirements, and different taxonomies across different region. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, areas where we could help using technology to um, uh, both help the buy side investors on how they can understand better understand the benefits of ESG, but also on the sell side, how they could better disclose and prepare uh, their their uh, ESG related information and communicate that with the investors. So um, that's one of the uh, few initiatives we're we're focusing on. The other piece is um, replicating our document comprehension technology beyond capital markets. So essentially, um, we have very successful use cases in research and due diligence, but. Uh, p- companies in other sectors also have a lot of reporting to do, and a lot of them involve documents. So what we're building essentially is how to allow companies without a lot of data science capabilities to still be able to use and build their own AI and their own neural network. I think the vision we're, we've set here is uh, all the companies have their own personality, and they shouldn't rely on uh, on an off to sh- off the shelf AI model built by a third party. So we're empowering different companies to build um, purpose driven specific uh, AI with the tools that uh, we, we can provide. So we're building, for example, a no code annotation platform mm-hmm. where uh, even if a company don't have any software and data science capability, their analyst, their uh, 
industry expert, subject matter expert can still uh, log in. They can collaborate and train AI using the tools that we provide through this platform without any coding. So we feel that's a very powerful uh, thing that we're doing and how we're changing how corporates um, work in the future. Um, thank you very much for the vision uh, and everything you explained to me are really clear until now. Um, I have a couple of questions about the beginning of your company. Sure. Uh, and did you face any challenges when you start and how did you overcome those challenges there? Oh, where, where can I start, right? <laughs> for, for all the founders, uh, for me specifically, um, when I first started, uh, I, I don't have anything. So we call it um, the, the trio, uh, the, the trinity of a start, which is having a product, having a market and having resources. I, I did not have any of those. So it's about um, finding the right uh, partners, people who are willing to help uh, in the very beginning. I, I'm very blessed to have met many people, many friends who have helped me along the way. So they could be mentors, they could be um, people within the ecosystem. So I think the scene has also changed a lot over uh, the past four or five years since I started. Uh, I think back then um, we did not have so much support. Uh, I mean, even this podcast, I think we don't have those uh, back then, especially in Hong Kong. So it was quite difficult to find traction. Uh, you know, nobody has heard of the word rec tech. Uh, if not fintech, right? Um, and, and people think of fintech very differently. Back then, there is still a lot of payment-related application, not so much on uh, capital markets and, and research. And maybe a lot of focus uh, was put on the compliance side, right? So essentially, uh, my the difficulty was how we could, or I could pull different um, uh, levers to get closer to a product. So... Uh, I think my priority was building a product. So I actually, you know, when I first started myself, learned a bit of coding, I built an MVP, you know, all that very exciting. I didn't start in a garage. There's no garages in Hong, Hong Kong, Kong. <laughs> but, but I started in a coffee shop. <laughs> so so uh, that was fun. I, I think thinking back then, um, you know, there are, of course, moments where I would think, hey, why am I doing this? But I hatched that by quitting my job. I know if I work this part time, I would then, you know, give up. So I think there's a bit of naiveness, but uh, it's also, you know, sinking the ship before I move to another new ship. Um, and I'm glad it worked out. And how did you find your first uh, partners in your company? Sure, sure. So uh, I started the company myself, but I think through different process and, and just meeting people uh it doesn't have to be people who are interested in startup. It could be people who are not yet doing startup, but uh, the the vision and the um, the personality fit, you know, the overall team that I'm trying to build. So I think the biggest challenge till now, and it's still a challenge, is finding the right talent. We put a lot of energy in talent cultivation, but also uh, understanding what our current team. Uh, is really good at. So back then is what I'm good at and less good at and uh, who would probably be the one who can uh, grow together. So uh, very blessed to have uh, found my, I think my first uh, colleague that I, I found still with us today, our, our head of technology. So uh, he did not come from a startup background, took a lot of convincing uh, and then, you know, join us and, and till today. So we still keep um, uh, focus apart from selling and, and promoting the company. Uh, I, I spend, you know, one third of my time on people. And that's not just uh, managing the team, but also on recruitment. So I, I, I myself is a fintech lecturer at Hong Kong U Space. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of universities here in Hong Kong. Um, could be doing sharing. I have the course uh, in fintech. I also work on different types of research with uh, different professors. And, um, you know, that really helped bring the profile to be more um, young people friendly, to be more innovation friendly. So people who are, you know, uh, they want, if they want to try new things, they would come to us uh, uh, naturally. Uh, a lot of times we, we asked, uh, candidates you know why don't you join the big banks uh, and come to us and and the response is quite amazing uh, they tell me you know uh, a lot of companies 
say they're doing AI, but uh, there's a lot of strings attached. <laughs> and, and, you know, some companies don't even let you install the right programs to do it. Um, and which is why uh, they've heard about us. There's word of mouth uh, from interns and, and students and also uh, people who have worked with us. And they come to us naturally telling, you know, we, we know you do NLP. I, I studied NLP or I'm really interested in that. So, you know, it, it's a it's a it's a it's like dating. Right. We, we find there uh, it's a, we're trying to attract talent. We're passionate about what we do. I did several interviews before, uh, and everyone's here, like Erwin from One Degree, Ambrose from Medicare, Brian from Sugarup, told me that they spend at least a couple of hours every week just to speak with people and see if they're a good fit for their company. Seems that it's a big trend right now between all the entrepreneurs in fintech to uh, find the right person and spending, a, you say, one third of your time, maybe like uh, 10 hours per week as well doing this. Um, what is the key element for you to consider a candidate to become maybe a future employee of your company? Yeah, great question. So we look a lot at um, their passion and, and their character. Um, I feel startup is not for everyone. And, and there's, no, um, clear, there's no clear one is better than the other. And what I mean is, you know, big companies, smaller SMEs, it really comes down to the personality. And if you're someone who are... Uh, very who grow in an environment where things are fast changing, but also comfortable with a, lo- a very wide scope of things, but not scale. And and that's basically characteristics of a startup. Uh, also, um, uh, we need people who can uh, be self motivated to think about new ideas and and be comfortable with having no one telling them what to do. I think that's very important. And I feel you know there's a lot of uh, young people today who who are very well prepared for that, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I'm quite surprised that way. I, I think when I first started working, I wouldn't be able to do a <laughs> startup right away. I, I learned uh, as as we um, uh, as I the company grew, uh, but um, I think for for young people today, the next thing is what drives them, what motivates them. So if they're always thinking about solely on their own career pr- progression and what they want to do, then it's probably not suitable for them. Because in a startup environment, you have to think about what the trends are and where the trends would take you. So no matter how smart and powerful you are, if you're in the wrong trend, you know, you're in the wrong pond, uh, even if you're a big fish, uh, you would you know dry out someday. So we need people who think very holistically rather than just thinking, hey, I want to be this and that it's like what does what does the market need uh right now um you share a lot with us so i, I won't ask you to stay more but uh, i have a couple of uh, conclusion questions for you okay. um is there any takeaway you hope the listener uh, get from this interview um be open-minded uh be humble um when uh, depend on what type of listeners so if you're someone who really trying to do your own startup, uh, think about uh, new ideas. Um, be, really, uh, listening is quite important. Uh, I know some friends who, who uh, want to do startup, but you know, struggling to find uh, problems to solve. So it's like a product chasing pain points. Um, I think uh, when, go with your heart, I think that's the, the key takeaway. Uh, uh, when the heart tells you it's it's the right way, then there's no regret. Even though you know there's always difficulty, don't overthink it. Go with your heart, uh, but also uh, don't neglect your family and and friends. Those those people would be your spiritual support when you don't have uh, you know your boss, your big boss uh, supporting you. So. Yeah, I do agree <laughs> with you. Friends are very important, and you need to have a stable life and balanced life to re. Really- you know, sometimes step back a bit from the pressure and uh, look up, just look up, just not being so, uh, you know, focused on the problem or on the small world there. Exactly. Um, where our listener can know more about you and your company? Do you have a blog? Do you share a lot of content on LinkedIn or maybe on Twitter? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So do follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, if they want to learn more about me, you know, message me. Uh, they can, of course, uh, visit our website. Um, we also have a, a wide range of solutions. So if you work in capital markets and wish to learn more, 
uh, just ping me. Uh, I'm happy to show you more about what we do. So the best way to contact you is through LinkedIn? Yes. Okay. Um, so if you want, want to reach out to you, they will do it like this. Um, do you have any blog with your company? Do you do some articles time to time? So Yeah. Um, so so uh, in terms of content, I do uh, help a lot of friends to do sharing, sometimes at school, sometimes at university, maybe like podcasts like this. So I do share uh, most of these content on, on LinkedIn as well. Uh, we have a company uh, media page where we also uh, keep up to speed on um, you know, uh, or keep our investors and, and clients up to speed on our uh, media development as well as product development. So if you're interested to learn more, uh, just visit those. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you. The discussion was really clear for me. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I find this really uh, enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening or watching this video. Uh, feel free to reach out to uh, Calvin and to me if you have any more questions. Feel free to also to share this video or this podcast to your friends. And I will see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.